We're continuing our study in the book of Exodus. Chapter 25 through 30 has been instruction on the tabernacle. God was telling Moses uh, what articles should be created and how they should be created. We saw that there was the uh, sanctification and purification of a priesthood that could offer worship on behalf of the nation of Israel in the tabernacle. In chapter 31, we see God appoints two uh, Jewish men to lead the effort in constructing the articles of the tabernacle. Um, Bazael and also, that's, he's in, mentioned in verse 2, and then Holiab is mentioned in verse 6. These were men that God gave his spirit, the Holy Spirit, in order to have the wisdom and the understanding to create the articles of the tabernacle just as God wanted them uh, created and put in place. That brings us to chapter 32, and we're picking up now with the narrative of the children of Israel as they're still at Mount Sinai. Moses is up on the mount. This is his fifth trip up the mountain. He's been there for 40 days and nights. And we read at the end of chapter 31, verse 18, that God gave him two tablets with the law written on uh, both sides. And so he's going to be bringing those down the mountain uh, very soon. Unfortunately, there's a sad state of events that occurred down in the camp. While Moses was on the mountain, Josh was halfway up the mountain. Uh, the elders were supposed to stay there and wait for Moses to come down, but everyone but Joshua returned to camp. But Joshua's been patiently waiting, and um, we'll pick up now in chapter 32, and this is the events that happened in the camp of the Israelites while Moses was up on the mount. It says in verse 1, Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that should go before us, as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in your ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. A molded calf. Then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings, and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat, to drink, and rose up to play. As we think about this chapter, a sad chapter, uh, Exodus 32, uh, we didn't take the children of Israel long before they committed idolatry and broke one of the commandments that the Lord had given them. They weren't supposed to make any, have any gods before them, make any images. Now, their response is not to reject the leadership of Jehovah. They still wanted to honor Jehovah, but they sinned in making an idol, an image related to Jehovah that, that Jehovah hadn't ordered. Um, it didn't reflect him at all. This was man's concept of who Jehovah was in, in the figure of a golden calf. It's very degrading to God to create an image of him that isn't him at all. Uh, we do it today often in our imaginations. Uh, sometimes you'll talk to individuals and they say, well, God to me is da-da-da-da-da. And what they're doing is creating a God in their own mind which uh, will approve of their lifestyle and their, their sin. And the God that they've created doesn't uh, judge them. Uh, he's okay with their sin. And it's still a form of idolatry. It may not be the golden calf, but it's still idolatry. As we think on this chapter, there'll be seven points of application is, that we can draw from it. Um, the first is excess 
tends to promote idolatry. Excess tends to promote idolatry. The Israelites were slaves in Egypt. They didn't have golden earrings while they were in slavery. But after they despoiled Egypt and departed, they had the gold and silver of Egypt and they were adorning themselves with it. And it was quite available when the opportunity came to commit idolatry, to use it to make a golden calf. And it's true with us, excess tends to promote idolatry. Idolatry is anything that would rob our devotion and affection for the Lord Jesus. Anything that uh, may be relationships, it may be resources, um, maybe business arrangements, uh, sports, education, the list is quite long of things that could displace the Lord in our lives. And it's true, especially in uh, North America, where we have uh, so much wealth, that wealth tends to strangle our spiritual life. The more wealth we have, the more things we have, the more things Satan has to strangle us with. Uh, when we're living just with necessities of life, uh, we're laboring day in and day out just in a survival mode, then we have very little uh, resources uh, to promote idolatry. So excess tends to promote idolatry. Um, in 2 Corinthians, Paul tells the Corinthian believers that there should be equality among the Lord's people. This is in chapter 8. Uh, it isn't that we all, all believers, own everything together, but we don't think highly of what we have. It's to take care of each other. And so if someone's lacking and we have, we should give to them and vice versa, that there might be equality among the saints. Um, Paul told uh, Timothy to labor with their hands and what is our clothing, our food, shelter, the necessities of life, and the excesses beyond that are, are what leads us into sin. We're to be content with the necessities of life and not uh, being pursue uh, wealth. If God gives it to us, it's a provision to bless others. And here we see that excess uh, led the people of God into idolatry. So they offered sacrifices to this version of Jehovah that they had created, um, and then they rose up to play. In verse 6, this is our second point, idle time allows for lusting and a response. God's people were idle while Moses was up on the mount. And when people have extra time, it tends not to be used for spiritual things, it tends to be used to indulge the flesh and the impulses of the flesh. Uh, I have found through the years that keeping busy in the Lord's work is a great defense against lusting and doing and thinking things that I ought not to. We all have this nature within us that wants in so way it opposes the things of God. But if we keep busy in the Lord's work, keep his, busy with our thoughts about Him, meditating in God's Word, in prayer, uh, encouraging other saints, um, doing the things the Lord wants us to, then we have no time uh, to expend in other things that will grieve his heart. First point, excess tends to promote idolatry. It robs our affections from the Lord. And the second point, idle time allows for lusting and a response to lusting. Verse 7, And the Lord said to Moses, Go, get down, for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves they have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and indeed it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore, this is the Lord speaking. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them. I may consume them, and I will make you a great nation. Now, the Lord says this in order to get Moses to intercede for the nation of Israel. God had made promises uh, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, 
uh, to take this people out of Egypt, make them a nation, bring them into a promised land. And God was going to keep his word. But they had sinned greatly against him and his anger was burning against them. It was a righteous indignation. Sin, the sin, this offense needed to be dealt with. And so he says, I'll just destroy this nation and make of you a nation out of you, Moses. Well, Moses did exactly what God wanted him to do, and that was to intercede for the nation of Israel, which is our third point. God loves an intercessor. God loves it when people that are in good fellowship with him and communion with him will stand in the gap for those who aren't, um, the wayward, the wicked, uh, making intercession. God has a righteous uh, anger against sin, and yet through intercession that can be tempered with mercy. And so Moses is going to teach us uh, what advocacy is. How do we make intercession for others before the Lord? And there's three things here that Moses does. He says, um, verse 11, Moses is pleading with the Lord, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak and say he brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have spoken of, I give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. Again, God loves an intercessor. He knew the heart of Moses, and he knew that Moses would step in, stand in the gap between a holy God and a sinful people, and beseech him for mercy. Moses does three things here in making intercession. First of all, he calls out the honor of God's name. God had... Um, and in the name of Jehovah had done great powers and wonders in Egypt and brought his people out of Egypt with a, with a mighty hand. And so Moses is saying, you've demonstrated your power. It was done in your name. For the honor of your name, I don't destroy your people. And then in verse 12, he reminds the Lord that they are his people. So he he. Uh, pleads for God's honor, and he pleads with God because they were his people. And then in verse 13, he reminds the Lord of his past promise to the patriarchs to make a people from their descendants and bring them into the land. So these three things, um, Moses uh, relates to God as an intercessor. He re uh, thinks of God's honor, he thinks of God's people, and he thinks of God's promises. And he makes it very personal. This is your honor, this is your people, these are your promises. So relent of this. And it says that God relents. Very strong language by Moses to the Lord. Uh, he steps in the gap with authority. He knows the heart of God, he knows that God doesn't want to destroy his people, but at the same time God is holy, and what his people have done has stirred up his anger and they deserve judgment. And it says God relented. Whose will was done this day? Was God's will done? Was Moses' will done? And I would have to say yes and yes. God's will is always done. And uh, in this day, Moses' will was done too. God loves an intercessor and he found one in Moses. Moses stood in the gap, made intercession, and so the nation of Israel are, is receiving mercy at this time. There will be consequences for sin. We'll see that before the end of the chapter. There always are consequences of sin. Um, we choose our sin. God chooses the consequences of our sin. And in this case, though, the consequences would be tempered with mercy because Moses was a 
faithful intercessor. Verse 15, And Moses turned and went down from the mountain, and the two tablets of the testimony were in his hand. The tablets were written on both sides, on the one side and on the other were they written. Now the tablets were a work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. But he said, Moses said, it is not the noise of the shout of victory, nor the noise of a cry of defeat, but the sound of singing I hear. In other words, they were merrymaking. It was the uh, noise of the clamoring flesh having its own way in the camp that Moses heard. And so Moses brings the law, and it's already been audibly given, to Moses as we read back in Exodus 19 and 20. Uh, here God actually writes it on tablets so there would be a permanent record of his laws within the camp and Moses was to bring it into the camp. Moses is coming down the mount. He meets Joshua. Joshua says there's a sound of war in the camp. Moses said no this is the merrymaking, the sounds of singing. The fourth point is that it's God's word that tests our heart. It shows us what's in our hearts. And God's word will be a test. Uh, we read that back in Exodus chapter 16. God was going to test them with the manna. Would they obey him? And so we realize that God's word is put before us to show us what's lurking in our hearts. Sometimes we don't know what's there until we're confronted with the command. And then if we just faithfully obey it and submit to God's will, then it shows that we have a heart for him. But if there's other things lurking there that would cause us to not yield to God's commands, his laws, uh, maybe we uh, take secular wisdom or we take human reasoning uh, or we follow our feelings, whatever it might be, and we make excuses for not obeying the Lord. And so the law tests our hearts. It shows us what's actually in our hearts. The elders were supposed to wait on the, the mount, but they didn't obey the word of God. They went back to the camp, and that uh, going back to the camp was disobedience, and disobedience, father's disobedience, and it was just a downhill spiral for the events in the camp. And as we see now, they're dancing around, merrymaking around, uh, a golden calf, which they're calling Jehovah, and God's anger on the mount is burning. Verse 20 we read, Then he took the calf which they had made, this is Moses, he took the calf which they had made, burned it with fire, and ground it into powder, and he scattered on the water, and made the children of Israel drink it. Moses was showing that God's people cannot have um, mixed affections. They, they must be totally sold out for the Lord. And likewise, to serve the Lord Jesus faithfully, we cannot have mixed affections. The Lord Jesus said you can't serve two masters. You can't serve God and money. And so uh, we have to make a decision. If we're um, sold out for the Lord Jesus, we're going to follow him no matter what the cost. And that's what he wants. Christ, the Lord Jesus has to be our first love. That was the rebuke of the church of Laodicea, uh, sorry, the church at Ephesus in Revelation 2, is they had lost their first love. Um, they had mixed affections. And uh, the Lord rebuked them twice in that, that the letter to the church at Ephesus for not being, that he was not their first love means that every other relationship needs to be a distant second. And uh, our love for the Lord Jesus far outweighs all other relationships. And that was point five. To serve the Lord, we must be completely devoted to the Lord. We can't have mixed affections. Moses said to Aaron, verse 21, What did the people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? Did they threaten you, Aaron? Did they twist your arm? Do they uh, somehow coerce you into this? And 
Aaron said, uh, do not let the anger of my Lord become hot. You know the people that they are set on evil. For they said to me, make us gods that should go out before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know <clears throat> excuse me, what has become of him. And I said to them, whoever has any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it to me, and I cast it in the fire, and then the calf came out. Now when Moses saw that the people were unrestrained, for Aaron had not restrained them to their shame among their enemies, then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let every man put on his sword and on his side, and go in and out from the entrance <clears throat> to entrance throughout the camp. And let every man kill his brother, every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. Then Moses said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, that he may bestow on you a blessing this day for every man has opposed his son and his brother. When Moses confronts his brother Aaron, Aaron tells him that the people, you know, they're, they're disobedient, stiff-necked people, Moses, you know how they are. They told me to make them uh, a god to worship, and uh, I told them to break off the gold earrings in their ears. I threw the gold in the fire, out jumped a calf. Aaron was not taking responsibility for his sin. Um, it's remarkable that Aaron will become the high priest of Israel after this initial offense with the golden calf. Plus, the people weren't restrained. They were partying, making merry. They were fornicating uh, before the Lord. Um, they were unrestrained. The King James reads in verse 25, they were naked. And I think that's the idea. They were just unrestrained, carnal appetites coming out. It's the worst of mankind. Uh, we find this in Romans chapter 1, that whenever man uh, says no to the truth of what God has revealed about himself and enters into idolatry, that the worst of man comes out. Um, the Spirit of God doesn't work with us when we're in rebellion uh, to understand the truth. He wants us to obey what already has been revealed. And when we uh, thumb our nose at God and His truth, uh, God pulls away and the, rust, the worst of our nature comes out. And the worst uh, sins uh, described in Romans chapter 1, often sexual sins, talking about uh, man with man, uh, men with men and women with women and so forth, uh, come out. We are given over to a rep reprobate mind. This had an effect of causing shame upon the Lord's name. And that's our sixth point. The, the sin of the Lord's people causes shame on the Lord's name. Aaron should have restrained the people, and yet they were, they were acting like animals. And um, I just want to read a, a portion of scripture from Romans chapter 2. Um, in Romans 1 and 2, Paul is giving three evidences why all men have sinned. He talks about creation demanding a creator. And when we reject that revelation, that proves that we're sinners. He talks about our moral conscience in chapter 2. And the fact that if we feel guilt, our conscience has been invoked, we've, um, we've violated that internal program, programming within us. And that's proved that we're sinners. And then God has given this law to the, the Jewish people. They didn't follow it. Breaking the law proved that they were sinners. But notice what Paul says here when he's indicting the Jews on their behavior. He says in verse 17 of Romans 2, Indeed, you are called a Jew, and rest on the law, and make your boast in God, and know his will, and approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law. 
and are confident that you yourselves are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. You therefore who teach another, do you teach yourself? You who preach to a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You make your boast in the law. Do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. So what was Paul was saying is, you think you're a special people because you have a law, because you have circumcision. They wore it like a badge to say, I'm a Jew. But he goes on to explain that a true Jew is one who inwardly has a circumcised heart that reflects the morality and life that God wants from his people, as in dictated in the law. So they knew that stealing was wrong, but yet they still stole. They knew adultery was wrong, but yet they were committing adultery. And the, the effect of this was to cast disdain upon the name of God. The Gentiles uh, were looking upon the Jewish people with Wow, they, they have their God and they have their law, but they don't do it. And uh, so they didn't think much of the Jews' God. He couldn't enforce his law on his people. His people didn't want to obey his laws. So why think highly of the Lord? And so today, our character, as demonstrated in what we do and say, is a direct reflection upon the name of Christ. When we disobey God's commandments and we act in a way that's ungodly and we're naming the name of Christ, what we're doing is, is disdaining the name of Christ. We're, we're causing blasphemy, uh, a degradation to be associated with the name of Christ. It'd be better off never to name the name of Christ than to bring disdain upon his name. The Gentiles didn't know the Lord. They didn't know Jehovah. They weren't under the law. They had no covenant. They weren't his people. And so it was much worse for the Jews to identify with Jehovah and then blatantly not do his law. And that caused the, blas the Gentiles to blaspheme his name. Likewise, we cause uh, the Lord Jesus' name to be blasphemed if we um, do not obey what he says. Uh, this should be a, a really heartbreaking thing for us. Often when there is a sin that comes out, maybe within the family or the local church, we first think about the repercussions to our family name or to the local assembly. And our first response should be, um, how is this going to cause blasphemy upon the name of Christ? Um, that's what the enemy wants to accomplish, is to cast doubt and and cast darkness on the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The seventh point is um, shown to us in verses 27 through 29, and that is idolatry brings God's wrath. It has to. He hates it. It's tempered with mercy here, but the day that the law was given to Moses on the tablets and he brought it down. He didn't bring it in the camp. It would have been certain judgment on the camp. So he broke the tablets before he entered the camp. And there's a call of separation. And he said, who's on the Lord's side? The sons of Levi came to Moses. He said, strap your swords on and go and kill the violators. And that day, 3,000 men died. So the judgment fell. Uh, idolatry brings God's wrath. And uh, the day the law was given in tablet form to Moses, 3,000 died. We have a, a lovely uh, parallel picture here from the Old Testament to the New Testament. On the day of Pentecost, when the church was created, the Holy Spirit baptized uh, believers into the body of Christ. In Acts 2, 3,000 were saved. Uh, on the day that the law was given, 3,000 died. The law couldn't save. It only brought death. It brought condemnation. But in Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, man can experience life, true life in Christ. 
at the Tower of Babel because of man's disobedience, God confounded the languages and spread people abroad. But on the day of Pentecost, people were gathered together and through the power of the Holy Spirit, the Lord's disciples were able to speak in different languages in order that the gospel could be heard. So we have the blessings of the uh, church age contrasted with what we see in the Old Testament in relationship to man's disobedience to God's previous stewardships or the dispensations that he has put man under. And the only answer to man's disobedience is uh, the dispensation of grace found in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in the church age, we Gentiles can become God's people, baptized into the body of Christ, the church, through the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to stop um, this particular study at verse 29 because in verse 30, Moses is going to trek up the mountain for a sixth time, and we're going to see that this uh, is each of these seven trips up the mountain relate to each of the seven major dispensations or stewardships in Scripture. This sixth trip uh, beautifully typifies the dispensation of grace in the church age. And so we'll save the end of chapter 32 for our next study as we get into Moses' sixth trip in chapters 33 and 34. Again, just to review these, six, these seven points of application, excess tends to promote idolatry. Idle time allows for lusting and a response to it. God loves an intercessor. And remember that Moses appealed to God's honor. Um, he reminded God of his people and of his promises. And fourthly, God will test our hearts with his law to show us what is lurking in our hearts. And we should expect that and want that. It reveals to us, God already knows what's in our hearts, but we don't until uh, we respond uh, appropriately or not appropriately to his word. Fifthly, to serve the Lord, we must be completely rid of mixed affections. Idolatry is anything would rob our affection uh, from the Lord. Um, we're to set our affection singular in the heavenly places, Paul says in Colossians chapter 3. He has to be our first love. Number six, sin causes shame on the Lord's name. When we don't act, behave the way we should, uh, we causing, naming the name of Christ, we cause uh, disdain upon the Lord's name. And lastly, idolatry brings God's wrath. And um, it has to be so God is angry when we love other things, other people more than him. And uh, he will judge it. He's jealous over us. Uh, Paul told that to the church at Corinth in the second epistle. The Lord has a, uh, a godly jealousy. He had a godly jealousy over them because they were one with Christ. Um, we are the espoused bride of Christ, and the Lord is very jealous over us. So may we keep our hearts pure, free from idols, free from lusting and sin, keep busy in the Lord's work, knowing that God is a jealous God, and he will punish us if we embrace anything that displaces him from our hearts. Father, we thank you for this text. It's very exhortive. We pray, Father, we would stay on the straight and narrow, that we would have no mixed affections, that we would create no idols uh, in our minds or embrace them in relationships or um, in other things that we might be doing or owning or having that would uh, displace our love for you. Uh, Lord, we want to have your favor and your mercy and your grace, not your displeasure, not your wrath, not your punishment, uh, as a, a father disciplining his disobedient children. So we pray, Father, we would be walking with you in spirit and enjoying fellowship with you. We ask in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.